Whitmer. Program signed. Uh, the session is now open to the public. Advised members are welcome to use Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as their airplane mode or all devices are muted. If you're content, I'll proceed through the agenda as follows. First of all, apologies. Apologies have been received by Matthew. Uh, Pat, has Matthew give you, given you any voting rights? Or No. Okay. I don't think there's anything that's likely to come to your vote, but uh, in that case as well. Uh, anybody seen Paul? Ah. Welcome, Paul. It's not like you not to be here. Yeah. Uh, members aware? No, we're okay. Happy. Uh, declaration of interests? Uh, members of uh, Crowd Union. Okay. Thank you. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings from the 25th of November 2020. Uh, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? Gemma, you're the one who normally gets the award for having read them in <laughs> no, greatest I, detail. I think, I think they're okay. Okay. Are we happy for content? Happy for them to go on the website? Thank you. Uh, matters are rising. Statutory rules and breach of the 21 day rule. Uh, at last week's meeting, the clerk was instructed to establish how many statutory rules have breached the 21 day rule during the current financial year. Since 2020, six statutory rules have breached the 21 day rule and all relate to coronavirus. The examiner of statutory rules has reported that she is satisfied with the explanation provided by the Department and all statutory rules. The Department has in five cases advised the Committee at the SL1 stage that the statutory rule will be in breach of the 21-day rule. There was no SL1 for one statutory rule due to its urgency considered at last week's meeting. Are we content? Moving on to the oral evidence. Uh, first part of oral evidence today is the Amendment to Building Regulations Northern Ireland 2012. I remind you the session is being recorded by Hansard. I'll be welcoming uh, sort of Fer 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 Fergal Murphy, uh, General Manager from Kingspan's Insulation. Fergal, can you hear us? Fergal, can you hear us? <coughs> yeah. Let me know if you can hear it. P put your thumb up if you can hear me, Fer Fergal. I can't hear him. <coughs> He's muted. Fergal. Um, have you got Alan? Can you hear us? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you now. Is that Fergal and Alan with you? It's off again. Yep. Yep. I just want to clear. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we yes, can he hear you, but you're fitting in and out a bit. Okay. Um, yeah, apologies for that. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're happy with that. And we're also welcoming uh, Chris Pittman, uh, General Secretary of the Engineering Panels of Construction, uh, also known as EPIC. Is Chris? Have we got Chris? Chris, can you wave your hand if you can hear us? Okay. Yeah. Good okay. afternoon, Chair. I can hear you fine. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, loud and clear. I advise members that uh, Jonathan Arnold, who is the Product Development Manager of Building Systems at Tata Steel, was scheduled to provide oral evidence. However, the Committee Office was informed this afternoon that we will not be able to join the meeting. Uh, Chris uh, has been advised that if there are any technical questions, he may have to respond in writing with detailed answers, if you are content with that, Chris, as we go through. I'd like to inform the members that the relevant papers are at the clerk's brief at page 14. A briefing paper from EPIC reproposed amendments <coughs> to building regulations at page 17. Uh, EPIC's response to the departmental uh, cons consultation at page 73. Correspondence from EPIC regarding proposed amendments to the building regulations at page 104. Uh, Kingspan's response to departmental consultation at page 106. Uh, correspondence from Kingspan regarding proposed amendments to the building regulations, page 181. Uh, the Grenfell article in The Guardian on the 25th of November uh, 2020 at page 185. Uh, a list of respond respondents to the consultations tabled at page 3. And could I ask Mr Murphy and Mr Pittman if they'd like to make a 
brief opening statement. Uh, over to you, gentlemen, please. Good afternoon, Chairman. I have an opening statement which covers three key points. If you are okay, we would like to proceed reading that now. Um, is that okay with the Chair? Yes, certainly. Okay. So, good afternoon. Thank you for your time today. And we very much welcome the opportunity to engage with you via video link on this very important topic. We will introduce ourselves. My name is Fergal Murphy. As you said, I am the General Manager for Kingsman Insulation. I am responsible for three insulation manufacturing facilities in Ireland. You may be familiar with our facility at Ballyclare in County Antrim, which employs 27 people. And we have additional insulation sites at Castleblaney County Monaghan and Askeaton in County Limerick. Kingspan Insulation is part of the wider Kingspan Group, which is headquartered in County Cavan and employs 15,000 people worldwide, operating across 150 sites. Our sister company within the group, Kingspan Water and Energy, have additional sites in Portadown, employing 300 people, and Newry, which employ an additional 41 people. I am joined here today by Alan Macklin, our technical director. Alan and his team are responsible for providing technical guidance on appropriate use of our products to designers, specifiers, builders, and relevant stakeholders. And with the permission of the chair, we would now move to speak about the consultation process. Yes, please. We are aware of your engagement with a wide group of stakeholders in this consultation process, and we watched your meeting with the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service last week. We would agree with many of the points they raised and we would state clearly today that our objective is aligned with theirs to ensure the safety of the community, occupants and firefighters when dealing with the topic of fire safety in buildings. We as manufacturers strive to provide appropriate products and systems in order to comply with regulations and to meet the previously stated objective of providing fire safe buildings for their occupants. We welcome the consultation with stakeholders which you began in August and you are aware and you referenced we have made a full statement in October. If it's acceptable with the Chair and the members, we will just detail our three points in the submittal. Yep. Point one is determining fire safety for product use. We believe that determining the suitability for products in use in a building should be based on appropriate evidence-based performance testing. For example, testing set out by the British standards and these would include areas of fire and thermal performance. Under the proposed ban, materials would be classified as combustible, non-combustible, or limited combustibility, based solely on bench scale tests of individual products, using tiny samples the size of an OXO cube. Relying on small scale testing to classify products oversimplifies the discussion and the complexity of fire safety engineering. These small scale tests give no consideration to how materials will perform when combined in a system as they would on a real building. They ignore the way that different components within that system will interact with each other and what might happen if just one of those components failed in a fire. There's nothing real life about the small scale tests used to decide if a product is combustible or non-combustible. So it makes no sense that we're looking at moving to a world where we will allow products on tall buildings without thinking how they would work together in a system in combination with all other materials involved. By contrast, Kingspan believes that large-scale system testing is the appropriate way to assess the performance of any given facade system across all building types with a floor over 18 metres. The rigorous British standard BS8414 test is specifically designed to assess the risk of fire spread over systems in a combined approach on a building, and this accords with the findings of the Hackett Report, which calls for a systems approach. The British standard BSA414 tests all of the many components that are used together to build a cladding system, including cavity barriers, just as they would on a real building. And this actual test wall is 3.5 metres by 2.5 metres by 9 metres tall. We believe that this is superior to small scale tests of individual products that then establish limited or non-combustibility. 
we are aware of a number of systems featuring non-combustible or limited combustibility insulation and cladding which have failed to pass a BS8414 but would be deemed compliant under current building regulations on the linear route. This demonstrates the robustness of the large-scale testing BS8414. Furthermore, several countries use British standard BSA414 for similar large-scale tests, including the USA, Canada, Sweden, Germany, Belgium, France, Ireland, the UAE, Australia and New Zealand. This evidences a strong international consensus that large-scale full system testing provides the best measure of fire safety. For these reasons, we are concerned that not putting all systems through a large-scale system test is potentially dangerous for building occupants. A combination of individual materials can only be deemed safe if tested in a full large-scale system, irrespective of their combustible or non-combustible categorization in the small-scale bench test. Small-scale should not be a substitute for large-scale. Ensuring then that all wall assemblies undertake a British standard A414 test with the testing results and the full assemblies published and available to all stakeholders would allow all stakeholders full visibility on compliance and the fire performance of the proposed wall construction on their relevant buildings. Should the committee be minded to allow the use of both non-combustible and combustible insulation where they are deemed appropriate for use by the British Standard 8414 large-scale test. This testing can be carried out in Northern Ireland. There are large-scale fire test rigs situated at the University of Ulster Jordanstown and at a new facility in Carrickfergus. Both are operated by Effectus, a widely respected global expert in fire testing. Developing and expanding large-scale fire testing requirements could allow the expansion of quality fire test and research jobs in the region and could lead to Jordanstown becoming a test hub similar to Warrington or other world-renowned test centres. The second point of our three points is the imp economic impact of a ban. Amending the building regulations and limiting the options for construction materials will have a significant economic impact. There are currently no manufacturers of non-combustible insulation in Northern Ireland, and this would mean that all the required materials will need to be imported. The unintended consequences could mean the loss of manufacturing jobs, both in Northern Ireland and the border regions. This scenario may be further compounded in a post-Brexit environment as these products come to Northern Ireland from mainland Europe. Our experience in England and Wales shows that while a proposed ban is limited to certain reference buildings with a story over 18 metres, many specifiers, developers and builders may switch over all buildings irrespective of height or building use as it becomes increasingly difficult to manage multiple specification types on small or mid-sized projects. This will further compound the potential for job losses in the insulation sector in Northern Ireland and project delays due to the constraints on supply of imported products. It is also worth noting that a recent survey commissioned by the Minister for Housing, Communities and Local Government has highlighted some adverse impacts that the ban has caused on the construction industry in England and Wales. And I include the key fo following key findings. 97% of respondents reported that new legislation is causing technical specification problems. 79.5% of respondents thought that construction detailing had now become more complex as a result of the UK ban. 79.5% of respondents reported that products normally available were no longer acceptable and that alternatives were hard to find. 68% of respondents said that the ban will have an impact on buildability and sequencing of projects and 52.9% of respondents noted impacts in delivery times for new projects. All of the above findings are likely to have a similar or greater impact on the Northern Ireland construction economy. It would appear that this new study has not been addressed in the economic assessment which forms part of the key consultation process. 
And the third and final point, Chairman, carbon emissions impact. Carbon emissions from buildings contribute 30% of our CO2 emissions. Fire safety is always our primary concern. However, we believe that systems containing Kingspan products are both capable of being fire safe and helping to deliver energy efficient buildings. Under the proposed ban, the only allowed products would be non-combustible synthetic mineral fibre insulation, which typically have a lower insulating performance for any given thickness when compared to traditional high performance closed cell insulation boards, resulting in the potential for buildings to have a higher carbon footprint. Delivering better insulated and net zero carbon buildings will be made more challenging by introducing a ban. Furthermore, non-combustible synthetic mineral fiber insulation is much heavier than high performance cell boards, again creating a requirement for larger structural supports and foundations. Additionally, the carbon footprint of buildings will be increased by the added road haulage of importing insulated products traveling from Europe to Northern Ireland. And finally, in conclusion, as noted earlier, the key outcome of this policy should be the highest performance standards for buildings and that changes should come with clear evidence base. We reiterate that this does not automatically mean opting for non-combustible material only as the best option. We would at this point reflect on our shared objective to ensure the safety of the community, occupants and firefighters when dealing with the topic of buildings and fire safety. And if the Department of Finance wishes to improve fire safety, we believe that large scale testing is a more robust and practical way to achieve this. Finally, we would ask the MLAs to consider adopting a solution closer to Scotland or Ireland, where British standard BSA414 large scale testing is a supported route to demonstrating fire safety on all relevant building types. Thank you for allowing me to read the statement. Okay, thank you very much. Could you uh, forward that uh, statement to the because it was quite detailed. Could you forward that statement to the committee so we can read that into we can have that formally uh, brought into the evidence as well. And, Certainly, no problem at all. Okay, and I would probably like Chris to sort of uh, give his presentation now, and then we'll open up to questions of of all three of you. Chris, could you uh, give your presentation now? Yeah, uh, that would be fine, Chair. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Splendid, thank you. Um, I'm not going to take too long because uh, a lot of what I have to say has already been said. Um, our point isn't um, that a ban on combustible materials is necessarily wrong. Our point is that it's not complete. Uh, and we simply like to say that um, by all means, um, go with the uh, the A1, A2, but don't only go with the A1, A2, because to ban products is a suboptimal solution. Um, Dame Judith Hackett said the UK government's own specialist, uh, pardon me, own independent expert panel uh, has recommended that, and I quote, the clearest way of ensuring an external wall system adequately resists external fire spread is for all the relevant elements of the wall to be of limited combustibility or to use an external wall system which can be shown to have passed the large scale system test as specified in British Standard BS 8414. And our only ask is that the Northern Ireland Assembly informs its decision based on this best guidance rather than defaulting to a um, ban everything and and uh, live with the consequences of that. Um, it's already been mentioned, Alan's already mentioned, uh, you should have somewhere among your documents or in the library um, the research that was produced by Adroit uh, on behalf of MHCLG, which uh, I sent to the Secretary last week. Um, and I won't go again through the list of those outputs. All I would say is that Northern Ireland has the opportunity to benefit from the experience of the ban in England. And we, we can demonstrate, Adroit's evidence demonstrates, uh, MHCLG have just undertaken another piece of work which hasn't yet been published to demonstrate that that ban um, has unintended consequences. Um, you know, the preamble to uh, 
to question B7 in your own consultation clearly acknowledges that buildings are complicated uh, elements and just testing the fire performance of one individual element is not a sure guide to how that whole building is going to perform in practice. That's why we, uh, we are manufacturers of large scale panel systems. A typical application for our products would be say, uh, the Charles Hurst Jaguar Land Rover dealership in Belfast, which some of you may be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are large buildings, complicated buildings, and the appropriate way to demonstrate the performance of the materials of which they are made is a large scale test of that wall, that complex wall as built. Um, I know it was mentioned in your discussions with the FRS, I'm not going to try and screen share, but I wonder if I can somehow position this so you can get a sense of what a BS8414 test rig looks like. This uh, here, mm -hmm. this is essentially a pallet load of wood, which is set fire to and the flames lick up the um, the outside of the building so it's uh, it's a very it is a large scale test and it's uh, it's an internationally recognized and very robust test our only argument is that you should not only default to uh, a non combustible solution it should be as in scotland non combustible or demonstrable evidence of performance and successful performance to a BS8414 test. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you very much indeed. Jim, thank you. Jim. Yeah, yeah, this is an extraordinarily serious issue and we all know why we're here. The one phrase that hasn't been used so far and this is Grenfell Tower. Um, we as a committee would be hung out to dry if we allowed um, this particular piece of uh, legislation to go through, but making absolutely certain that our public, uh, the people of Northern Ireland are, are safe. Um, and and oh, you disappeared. And uh, can you still see me okay? Can you still hear me? Because you're, you're fading away. It's gone. No, it's back. Can you hear me? Oh, we lost it. Are you back? <laughs> the wonders of modern technology. <laughs> yeah, you can hear me. That's good. I was just saying that that that. Oh, is he muted? Can Can you hear me? No, I can't. No. Do you want to address the questions to? Uh, oh, I can hear you now. Well, you, you can hear me now. You can, hear, can you hear me? Can you, could you speak just so we can pick you up? Okay, I can hear you. We, we, uh, we, could you speak uh, to I, I can hear you, sir. Oh, that's good, that's good, because your signal, your signal was very erratic there for a few moments. Just to repeat that we as a committee would be hung out to dry and, and lambasted, and quite rightly so, if we allowed anything to pass through this committee which endangered the lives of those living in high-rise buildings in Northern Ireland. The phrase that hasn't been used by either of the three witnesses is the phrase Grenfell Tower, which is absolutely horrific. Um, now, you say that you'd be quite happy if you had both the BS British Standard and the test that's been advocated here before us. So uh, products could, would have to face both, and that, that seems a reasonable compromise. But what tests of any were carried out on the Grenfell Tower cladding before that horrific disaster? Um, well, if you can you hear me, folks? Sorry. Yes, yes we can. Yeah. If you'll forgive me, I'm, yeah. it's it's difficult for us to comment on Grenfell Tower. But what we can say with some certainty is that the existing building regulations, which were in place when that place was put together, um, have got provisions in. Uh, your regulation 36 has provisions in that. Products which are affixed to the outside of buildings should resist a surface spread of flame. That's a very clear uh, requirement of the existing building regulations. And I believe I'm correct in saying that Judge Moore-Bick made it pretty clear in his summing up to the part one 
uh, of the Grenfell inquiry that these products had failed to meet that requirement. So it's not a question of whether the requirement was adequate, it's a question of whether the um, testing regime was appropriately followed. Uh, I can't comment uh, on the detail of that. Um, I can refer you, and I will gladly do so, to the relevant paragraphs of uh, Judge Morbick's report. Um, but of course, the inquiry is ongoing and the products are not represented um, in, in the panoply of the materials that my, man, my members produce. Right. Uh, given what, what you said, uh, it's clear that as far as the employment in Northern Ireland is concerned, this causes problems. I mean, I'm very aware, obviously, of the very large plant at Portadown. Um, 300 jobs are extremely important to that area. Surely there's an opportunity here for the industry in Northern Ireland is to manufacture products which meets, meet both tests mm -hmm. and, and therefore provide a reassurance to, to residents of tar blocks. Oh dear. Could I potentially come in on that point, myself and Alan? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, yes. I suppose there are a variety of products and systems which are available and tested for their suitability in terms of application to building types. As manufacturers, we would manufacture a wide range, and I'm, I'm sorry I would use some technical terms, but EPS, XPS, PU, or PIO, or right up through fiber products. So there are a wide range of products that are manufactured by insulation manufacturers and system providers. And um, I think in all cases, we would look at the most suitable uh, products in terms of a wide range of performance. Um, our point would, would remain that the BS8414 or other large-scale tests should be an applicable and suitable way to test all of the components together because an individual element may pass a non-combustibility test. And, and if I understand the question, um, individual purposes or individual materials or components may be repurposed. That still doesn't give us the certainty that when all of those individual components are joined together in a full through wall assembly, um, we would believe that testing and demonstrating very clear 8414 large scale British standard system test is the best and most appropriate way to demonstrate to all the stakeholders, specifiers, architects, occupants on the fire service that that through wall of components is large-scale tested and performs together with all of the components in the assembly. Yes, but, you, but you're, you're a vast company, um, uh, you know, obviously employing a lot of people and giving huge amount of employment to the people of Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. But I have to say this, you're not neutral in this debate. Um, you are the manufacturers. Uh, and do you understand our position that we have to be absolutely certain here that whatever is decided in this legislation is the most the safest for the people of Northern Ireland rather than the most convenient for the manufacturers? Uh, yes, we absolutely understand and, and respect that point. We as manufacturers will and can only provide products that comply with the legislation and the standards as set out by any of the relevant authorities and we would always seek to test those products which we put into the market against those standards which you have deemed the most appropriate. We have a, a view that the products as we would test would be applicable for those specific um, products and services. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, may I just add that to the best of my knowledge, there is no evidence to suggest that products or assemblies which have successfully passed a BS8414 large-scale test have gone on in real life to subsequently fail in a fire situation. Um, the products have consistently performed uh, in accordance with the results of the test uh, and the, the pass-fail criteria are quite stiff. So uh, it, it's a question of um, looking at the available evidence, I would suggest. Uh, I've, uh, one of the documents I've um, forwarded to the committee is some research that was carried out by TENOS into uh, large-scale fires where systems have been accredited to 8414, and they can find no evidence of, of behaviour which is out of what one would expect 
with the performance of the, the tested sample set. Uh, thank you, Rolf Leg. You're all very welcome. Uh, my line of question is not dissimilar from that which has been presented to you. Uh, do you have any idea, roughly, uh, just about the financial ramifications for your company uh, if a ban did go ahead? Um, we don't have any specifics conducted in relation to, to our own company. What we can tell you is that from the results um, or the the the, uh, the findings from the MCLG, MCHLG that respondents in that identify that the new legislation caused technical and specification problems, made buildings more complex and uh, alternative products harder to find. And, and we would have a view that that would be because those products would need to come from outside of the marketplace. Um, so we don't have any specific impact study conducted from our from our own business point of view. Uh, I'm disappointed at that, just that you wouldn't have an indication anyway uh, of the implications of that. But uh, it actually brings me right on to the next point that I was going to make, that uh, if combustible materials uh, are banned, then surely it would be in the producer's economic interest to repurpose yourselves and produce the, the safer material here in Ireland. Yes, if I could, could respond, um, we believe that the classification, the test that defines the classification for products being combustible, non-combustible, or limited combustibility, as we described earlier, being approximately the size of an OXO cube, doesn't necessarily demonstrate the most appropriate way to measure large-scale performance of a building in an assembly. So conducting a large-scale assembly test defines safety of the product and the full assembly when all of those components are measured together. And finally, just that uh, you place great emphasis on testing uh, a product that was used uh, in Greenville. Uh, it was marketed as safe to use. And it was claimed that the product had passed fire safety tests. And it now turns out that this wasn't true and the product had actually failed a fire test in 2007. However, Kingspan decided to keep using this product. Do you accept that there's an inconsistency with Kingspan suggesting that greater testing is needed, whilst you yourselves have products that failed safety tests and have ignored those very same tests? Does this not highlight a very serious flaw in the increased testing solution? And in fact, it would be again too leading on to who it is that would carry out those tests. Yes, um, I suppose if I could respond to that, neither Alan or I are personally involved in assisting the inquiry in its in its work. And um, there are Kingspan personnel in the UK assisting the inquiry. Um, Kingspan has acknowledged that there were shortcomings and has apologised for the shortcomings and have set out specific um, new processes and systems and changed in terms of the full traceability of the product, the K15 product, and incorporated new fire testing and accredited protocols. It is also true to say that the K15 Kingspan product that was supplied on the tower, had Kingspan been consulted, that product was not suitable along with the cladding and would not have been um, wouldn't have been BSA414 approved in terms of large-scale system in that particular assembly, um, and Kingspan would not have recommended that product for use in that application. And just in conclusion, you had commented to you on carbon emissions and that uh, using uh, the less combustible materials and so on, that that would increase uh, the carbon emissions. And I would just suggest to you, uh, at the cost of how many lives, uh, or is, is any life uh, meant to take less priority than i.e. carbon emissions in itself? Yes, I, I would acknowledge, um, and, and I think the point we said that carbon emissions contributing to 30% of our CO2 emissions, but fire safety was always our primary concern, and that would certainly be the case in our, um, in our products. 
Yeah. Um, oh, forgive me. I wonder if I might just make a supplementary point here that um, uh, the reason people um, come up with modern materials is because they wish to improve the performance of the existing legacy materials. We're talking about uh, an insulation product which can deliver the same thermal performance for half the thickness uh, and I think a quarter of the weight of the of the legacy materials. So uh, there are engineering considerations. These are higher performance products which can deliver better quality homes for similar kind of prices. Um, and they are all tested to appropriate standards anyway. So I don't know quite, it doesn't fully answer your question, but it does perhaps um, add a little more depth to the response. Jim. Yeah, good afternoon. I wanted to ask the Kingspan representatives a couple of questions, if I might. I want to press you further on the credibility of you telling us that you are devoted to large-scale testing in light of the quite shocking evidence this week to the Greenville, Greenfell Inquiry, where Kingspan had to admit that they distorted testing by, in respect of K15 after they changed its composition by continuing to rely on a previous test in promoting that product. And yet when that product, the new product was further tested, it was found that it burnt like a raging inferno. What credibility does Kingspan come with this, to this subject with that sort of admission having to be made this week at the public inquiry? I think I would respond. Although Kingsman Insulation is confident that K15 is and was safe for use within compliant systems, you've noted the historical shortcomings of what has happened, and we have offered and do offer a full and sincere apology for them. Um, we have made substantial changes to ensure that they cannot be repeated, and those changes introduced to date include full traceability on the K15 product, the publication of all BSA414 tests incorporating K15, new fire testing and accrediting protocols, and a new employee code of conduct. We are committed to the highest standards of fire performance in our products through continuous R&D and rigorous testing, complemented by technical support and accurate product information. Is it not the case that the gentleman giving evidence, and Mr. Philip Heath, on behalf of Kingspan, is still an employee, and he's the gentleman who had it quoted back to him that he said to a firm that you're getting me confused with someone who gives a damn. Is that the mindset of Kingspan? I would not believe that to be the, the culture of the business. It would be inappropriate for me to comment on, on Mr. Heath specifically, as he's a, a more senior member of, of, of staff. Still a member say, of staff. Still a member of staff. Is that correct? I suppose what? Still on the technical side. Is that correct? But yeah, Mr. Heath is still employed by Kingsman. Yes. And he's the gentleman who said, you must think I'm someone who gives a damn. Yes, as I said earlier, Mr. Heath and other Kingsman people are assisting the inquiry with their findings. Did, um, he also think... say, did he also say, in terms of cheating the certificate system, whereby a certificate was obtained for relying on the old test for the changed product. We didn't even have to get any real ill down him, referring to the official which issued the certificate. Yes, I acknowledge, and as the point I had made, Kingspan has offered a full and sincere apology and assurances that substantial changes have been made, and, and I noted and so for those already in relation to the accreditation protocols and the new employee code of conduct in place. But you come to us today 
telling us that you can be trusted to produce material subject to all the certifications and testing with a track record which shows that of avoiding and evading those very tests. The proposal that, that we put forward, which includes the large scale A414 uh, testing, the British standard A414 testing, would include the publishing of all of the test data to make it available to all of the stakeholders, be they the constructors, the architects, the specifiers, uh, building control, and the fire services, so that all of the relevant stakeholders would understand the components as constructed together. I think it's important to add as well that those tests are carried out by third-party organisations, which are UCAS accredited, and therefore are completely independent in terms of the test procedures and the results of those tests. Yes, but the point, sir, was that when you got the test, you then changed the product and then promoted the product as if it was that product that had passed the test when you knew it wasn't. And that product, when tested, burnt like a raging inferno, to the very point, according to the evidence, where the test had to be stopped in case it set fire to the laboratory. Now, do you not see the credibility issue when you then come to this committee and say, no bans, just tests, and we'll apply to the tests when you have a track record like that? I would reiterate the point that, that I made earlier that we have, and Kingspan have, fully apologised and sincerely apologised for the historical shortcomings. There have been learnings within the business and substantial changes to ensure that they cannot be repeated. Um, our hope would be that the BSA 414 as large-scale system test carried out by independent test houses with results published and all of those assembly components available to all of the parties or all of the stakeholders are then transparent and simple for all members to understand how those walls can be constructed in compliance with the regulations. Hear what you say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Philip? Uh, thanks. <coughs> Most of the, the points that I wanted to make have already been covered by M Melissa and Jim there recently. I mean, this is a difficult week, I, I, I guess, for representatives of Keenspan to be coming before any committee uh, and trying to argue uh, about credibility of the industry and argue about the credibility of the industry and testing, given, as, as Jim has pointed out, some of the evidence that has come to the fore yesterday and over uh, the, the tail end of November uh, about the industry and particularly about Keenspan and some of the things that were said and internal emails. I mean, our, this committee, uh, I suppose, has already been said our duty of care is to try and ensure that that something like Grenfell doesn't happen here in the north. And I, I'm struck by something that I think it was Chris said uh, in conjunction with something that uh, Representative Keenspans were saying that the combustible materials uh, in small quantities uh, are obviously safe, but there's not certainty about how they react when combined together in, in larger quantities. Well, I mean, surely then it's, it's up to the industry uh, to work to ensure that the materials individually and collectively uh, are non-combustible, rather than arguing for something, uh, testing that may or may not uh, be practical given what we've already discussed in regards to Grenfell. I mean, surely the industry uh, should be following guidelines where the individual materials collectively, uh, when they're put together, are non-combustible and that people's safety is the prime concern. I take that point. The overarching requirement of the building regulations is in Regulation 36, as Chris already alluded to, and that's the external walls and roof of a building shall be so designed and constructed that they afford adequate resistance to the spread of fire over them. Um, we would argue that the only way to assess that in, in reality is to test a large scale uh, assembly. And um, when we go back to the, the it, it's regrettable that the discussion and the narrative around fire safety has almost been diluted down to combustible versus non-combustibility. And I think it's important for the committee to understand 
the limitations and I suppose the nature of that small scale test in a little bit more detail. I'm, I'm not going to do a great amount of detail on the test, but as, as a basis, um, as Fergal alluded to earlier, a small sample of the material, about 50 grams, about the size of an oxo cube, is taken and ground into a powder. A small amount of that powder, about 0.5 of a gram, which is equivalent to about a tenth of a teaspoon, is then put into a bomb calorimeter test. And in an, in an atmosphere of pure oxygen, it's fully combusted. And that measures the gross calorific content of that product. Um, and it's important to note that there's limits there. So if it's less than three megajoules per kilogram, it's classified as limited combustibility. If it's less than two megajoules per kilogram, is classified as non-combustible. Not zero, but there's limit values there. We would argue that when you take those individual component products that, that achieve non-combustible or limited combustibility and put them into an assembly, you have no way of knowing how those components interact with each other. You have no way of assessing of the structural integrity of the panel under fire load. Um, we know from experience that the cavity width uh, and also the cavity gap between different panels and external cladding has an impact on how that, how that system performs in a large-scale test. And I suppose if there's any questions about the validity of BSA414 as a test methodology, um, we have seen and witnessed tests using non and limited combustibility products tested in a large scale assembly, which have failed that test. And that does two things. First of all, it demonstrates the robust nature of BSA414 as a test methodology, but also it brings into question the, the characterization of products on those small scale tests. Um, I think that's important for the, the committee to understand the question of scale. And in terms of, when you look back to the requirements of the building regulations and limiting fire spread over the facade, we would very strongly argue that the best way and the most robust way of demonstrating that is via a large scale test, rather than relying on individual components on a multi-story high rise building that has never been constructed and tested as an assembly. Uh, perhaps just um, add to that, that um, the person who decides what the building is going to look like, how it's going to be designed, um, how it's going to function, how it's going to meet its intended purpose, uh, is the building designer, the architect, the specifier, um, the, the individual who, who draws that assembly together to meet a specific purpose. There's a limit to the extent to which the manufacturer can influence that beyond saying, we think you should use our products. Um, so th there's the competence issue um, really sits with the, the building designer. What we're saying is that that building designer needs to be able to satisfy all the relevant authorities that his choice of materials is going to perform in such a way that in the event that there is a fire, it will not allow fire to spread in, uh, across the surface of that building. And that's why we're suggesting that what you need to have is a as-built assembly tested at scale so that you've got something i showed you the photograph at the beginning it's essentially designed to mimic what we saw at grenfell an established fire breaking out through a, a window and lapping up the outside of the building how does that product perform in real life in a real fire um, at real scale that is something that you can only effectively demonstrate with um precision and confidence if you've actually tested the as-built structure. If you're relying on adding together a series of laboratory results for individual elements, you're ignoring how those elements act together, any kind of air channels that may be between them, um, what the weather might be doing, a whole variety of other things which are completely beyond the competence of anyone who's manufacturing that product or bringing it to market to influence, which is, again, why we, we would argue not that you get away from the idea of using lab tests. They have some value, but they only have some value. We're saying that by all means, use lab tests to give yourself that, cons that confidence that the product is, is not going to, to go up the way the product on the outside of Grenfell went up, but also give yourself the option so that if a building designer wishes to put together some novel combination of products, some new product comes to market, um, some new uh, hyper green or hyper recyclable product that the designer wishes to incorporate into a design for, for whatever particular reason, that there is a path which gives you the confidence that that product will perform and that if anything goes wrong, uh, NIFRS are going to rock up and, it's, and, and find it performing in accordance with what they would expect. Um, for that, we believe you need a large-scale test just or the a, option of a large-scale test. Just, just, I'll, I'll come back in a second, but there's a question there. Come. 
I mean, one of the things, the questions here is why has England and Wales decided to go against this approach? Why have they decided to go for the laboratory tests? What has England and Wales seen specifically that they feel they need to deal with? Well, if you'll forgive me, I'm, firstly, I'd say Scotland hasn't. No, I'm, I'm asking um, specifically. It's obvious if you look at the size no, of the construction industry you, you, across the United Kingdom, England and Wales is a much larger potential market than Scotland and Northern Ireland is. So, as anybody, could somebody elucidate why England and Wales have gone down the laboratory route? If you were the Secretary of State for Housing Communities and Local Government in the wake of something like the Grenfell disaster, you would feel that you needed to make some kind of action which demonstrated that the government was firmly in control of the situation. James Brokenshire took the view and chose to announce it at the Conservative Party conference that he would ban combustible building materials. You can understand why he'd want to do that. Um, what we would suggest is that this was a political decision rather than fundamentally an engineering decision. It was a political decision which flew in the face of the evidence of Dame Judith Hackett's own report into the um, inquiry, into the, the fire. That's before the inquiry actually started. Um, but it was a politically motivated decision. We can understand that. I think I might what we're saying, what we would demonstrate is, is that the government's own research, which was carried out only, I think, six months, seven months after that uh, was announced, demonstrated that it failed to address the fundamental issues. It created the idea that if you use non-combustible, you will be safe, which we would venture to suggest is a, a gross oversimplification. The second thing it did, it had to include a whole variety of exclusions because there are a whole variety of building products which are not available in a non-combustible option. So if you look at the building regulations as they stand in, in England at the moment, yes, you, you've got a ban on the use of combustible cladding, but then you've got derogations for cavity closers, for uh, window detailing, for the materials of which those windows themselves are made, uh, for breather membranes, and a variety of other products which don't meet the spec. Now, our argument is you would be better served by saying go non-combustible or be able to demonstrate that the combination of products that are really going to be used in this uh, application will be able to pass a large-scale test, such as to give you confidence that they will perform adequately in a fire situation. Thank you. I mean, I'm just briefly going to come back in and ask, who, who, and apologies if you've covered this, but who would pay for the large-scale testing as proposed in your scenario? Well, typically in my sector, the manufacturers pay for it. Um, if a, uh, the, the photo I showed you earlier, oh, this is the after shot, um, was paid for by a contractor who wanted the confidence that the assembly he was going to be putting up was fit for purpose. It's a commercial transaction uh, based on the needs of satisfying the customer. So it's part of the cost of bringing products to market. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks very much for the presentation. I have to step out a little while there, just for a moment or two. So my apologies if some of the – I've only a couple of little points, Chair, if they've been covered. Uh, both Epic and Kingspan suggest that large-scale system testing would potentially be a more efficient method to demonstrate how products would perform. So my question to, to, to you is, how would this testing be certified or authenticated in order to ensure that tests are completely consistent and demonstrated uh, re reliability of the results? Taking in mind what you would said, where architects choose the materials in order to try and put on, so they need to be looking at shelf and at them that has been tested. Who tests the testers? Okay, well, the, the test facilities that, that, um, that do this kind of testing, BSA 414 testing, are UCAS accredited. So UCAS, UCAS are uh, a, a governing body that audit these test facilities and make sure that the tests are carried out in accordance with the test standards and uh, they're annually audited. So they, they are the ones who test the tests effectively. And the I think they're completely reliable and dependent upon. Sorry? 
They need to be completely reliable and dependent upon. That's why I said, I asked you, like, I mean, who would test these testers? So it is the manufacturers that do the tests? No, it's the, the UK authority that does audits the manufacturing, or sorry, manufacturers, the test houses. So they're the ones that provide the independent certification for the, the, the testing facility. Okay, and... So so, um, I, I think mention was made earlier of, of two test houses which are available within uh, within Northern Ireland, um, and I know the the committee was due to hear some evidence from uh, um, the the head of the fire faculty at Jordanstown this afternoon. I, I understand he's not been able to present, mm -hmm. but I do hope the committee will have the opportunity to speak to Ali at some stage. Um, these things have to be carried out by professional laboratories who are working against um, very clear terms for how to set up the rig. There's a whole variety of laboratory techniques which are embedded in the standards. And uh, I can think of nobody better, quite honestly, to, to guide the committee in your understanding of that than, uh, than Professor Najjar from, uh, from Jordanstown. Um, he has the very highest respect of EPIC. Yes, if I can pick up that point, there are two large-scale test rigs situated, as we mentioned, at the University of Ulster in Jordanstown and Carrickfergus. Affectus is the independent um, operator of those, and they are obviously a global expert in fire safety and testing. And as Alan pointed out, their operation is independently verified by, by UCAS. So they are the people who audit the testers. The manufacturers provide their products, and they are tested in accordance um, and under um, the guidance of both Affectus and then the UCAS as the independent Auditor of the Test House. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, you've got one more. Well, I haven't. Thank you, Chair. Kingspan states in its correspondence that currently there are no manufacturers of non combustible insulation in Northern Ireland. Uh, you indicated that the absence of manufacturers of non combustible insulation will have a significant impact on costs. Could you qualify what you find the price differential would be between materials with a different classification of uh, combustibility? No, we have, have no details or studies um, in relation to the cost differences. But we, the point we're making was that there's currently no manufacturer of non-combustible insulation in Northern Ireland, which would mean that those products would, would need to be imported from other jurisdictions outside of Northern Ireland. So there would be an unintended consequences for potential job losses of people manufacturing insulation in Northern Ireland. Um, and there would be a, a potential further uh, impact of material being shipped yeah, well, in from Europe to Ireland, but we don't have any specific uh, cost differences, no. Uh, could this be an opportunity then for manufacturers in Northern Ireland to repurpose their operations to meet that demand? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a, wider, a wider question. We would believe that the products that we make and manufacture when tested appropriately in a large scale system test would meet the requirements of the committee and of the regulations um, and that are safe for purpose. I think Alan outlined the point of not necessarily relying simply on the terminology of combustible versus non-combustible um, as, as the means of determining fire safety, but the opportunity to test full assemblies in large scale tests for all the reasons we spoke about previously, understanding how they would work and coordinate together to deliver a, a fire safe solution. Okay. Paul? Yes, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, time here and your question and answers. Uh, I suppose my question is around the two tests. Now, I get it. I, I am a practical enough guy. I, I worked in the construction industry. So I get the differences between the two tests, one being an oxo cube and a fume cabinet pure oxygen, and then one being a more practical test, a more test rig, uh, life-size scale. Uh, and I get your argument with regards to the practical use of a, of a material. My question is around the abuse and fraud and cheating the tests. What one of the two tests would be more liable to fraud and cheats? I, I don't think we can really comment on that, to be honest. I think that that's a, a matter for the, the independent third-party assessment bodies. Um, 
I think that, as you mentioned, BSA 414 and, and the test houses that carry out those assessments are UCAS accredited. They're independently audited and they're very clear and definable uh, standards to adhere to in, in terms of, of carrying out these tests. And that, that goes similarly for the, the small-scale reaction to fire test. They too are third-party verified external testing. Um, so those, those labs are also accredited by the relevant body in, in the jurisdiction that they're in. So um, to, to that point, um, all these tests are regulated uh, and a very limited opportunity to, to, to cheat those tests, if you like. When did they become regulated? Um, I, 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 I think Chris, I'm going to answer that in terms of UCAS, the UCAS accredit, or UK accredit, their accreditation authority. I'm not exactly sure when they were first initiated, to be honest. Why I ask that is because um, the... Sorry, if you want to come in, come on ahead. Um, uh, I'm, forgive me, Mr. Fru. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get to the sense of your question. Uh, the, the problem that, or one of the problems I have, having served the building industry in one capacity or another for most of my working life, is that um, if somebody wants to tell lies, um, there's actually very little practically that can be done on the ground to prevent them from doing so. If somebody wants to bring a product into the UK market with a CE mark on it um, from some Chinese manufacturer, all they have to do is send a PDF of a CD CE mark and the Chinese manufacturer will obligingly put it on. I've heard of occasions where, pl where plywood has been landed at Tilbury and somebody sitting in the shed has sat there with a stencil and a can of use spray and has put on it whatever standard and specification the customer wants for that plywood. Now, you know, um, forgive me, I, 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 this is a far deeper discussion, but it, there is a limit to how far you can stop people who have chosen to lie in order to gain some kind of commercial advantage from doing so. What we're suggesting is that the testing regimes to which they are subject um, should be take place in a, 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 an open environment and should be subject to scrutiny. And that the, whoever is responsible for incorporating these products in a building, increasingly now, and that's one good thing that's come out of the back of the Hackett agenda, is going to be personally liable in law to the very highest extent. Uh, that does concentrate the mind in a way that we haven't seen hitherto. But there's a limit to what you can do to stop people from telling lies. And no amount of product marking um, will stop that from happening. Yeah. You've got to have lot traceability yeah. from reliable manufacturers. Yeah, and again, I, I take your answer. Uh, uh, but again, it's, it's not just about getting a market advantage or it's not just about advertising standards. It's about safety and the fact that 72 people have died um, and, and I suppose we're trying to get to, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it by my questioning in regards to how feel safe mm -hmm. and how trustworthy are these are, are both of these tests and I suppose that's why I asked the question about what one would be more liable to fraud and cheat uh, and I simply ask that because I take your point that there's people, unscrupulous people out there who are prepared to lie, who are prepared to be bribed, who are prepared to take uh, money or some other gift or some other aspect in order to fraud the system or cheat the system or to give a false reading with regards to tests. And the evidence that we have seen this week, even in the Granville Inquiry, would suggest that that has been taking place within the industry where you have a company was able to set fire tests of its products to deliberately resist the spread of flames and give a misleading impression of safety. Now, that's not a market value. That's not a market advantage. Safety. Uh, and that's hence why I asked the question. But it seems to be the case that, given the evidence this week, that there have been skewing of results. There have been falsification of results and materials. And I would put to you, no matter what the test is, and no matter how efficient the test is, or how accurate the test is, if there's corruption at the heart of that, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. And it will lead to, it could well lead to massive risks that we cannot measure 
which could well lead to deaths, multiple deaths, either now or in the future. So this is a massive issue. Um, so I, my question is, if these test rigs that are set up, how, how feel safe are they to resist corruption, <coughs> falsification, and cheats? I think I would go back to the point that Alan made earlier, which is that the test houses themselves are independent. They are independently audited by UCAS. Um, we believe that in building the components into the large scale system test and detailing and testing the, the systems, potentially um, the availability of the fire services or relevant authorities to witness those large scale testing. We outlined that there are uh, test facilities on the ground in Northern Ireland potentially the, the joining by the fire service in witnessing those tests would give a degree of comfort. I'm not doing it already. Uh, and is that the case? I, 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 I can't remember if this question was asked at the fire authority last week, uh, that they would be present at all tests and would have uh, an input in that regard. Is that what you're saying? I'm not quite sure. Yes, what I was suggesting was potentially um, the, the fire service. Obviously, the, the building of the rig, the de designing of the components, the testing of the components as they work together in an assembly in the, the large-scale fire test. Um, and what I was suggesting was, while they are, they, the test house is operated by an independent third-party testing authority, um, I was suggesting that potentially the, the fire authority, the fire and rescue service of Northern Ireland, because there are test facilities in Northern Ireland on the ground existing today, they could um, witness those tests so that they had full understanding on what was being tested. What, what's the practicalities between the two tests? So if you have your oxocube, as you state, in a fume cabinet of full oxygen, uh, would you have to just test the material once or periodically? And in the other side of the other flip of this, if you were going to do the full rig test, the practical test, would that be then for every single building project and development? No, just the material. So under the, the European reaction to fire classifications of EN 13501, which is effectively your, your small scale tests, you are obliged uh, to have initial type testing done to categorize the product in terms of fire classification. You are then required under the, the European, the, the CPR, the Construction Product Regulation, to redo that test every two years. And we do that across our entire range of products in terms of its initial reaction to fire. With BSA 414, um, that large scale test is representative of, of a SAD assembly. Um, and we believe that that assembly should match and replicate what's on the actual building. Um, that test remains valid, provided the product doesn't change and the assembly doesn't change from that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, team, I've just got a few sort of final questions just to come up with it. Um, obviously, sort of in England and Wales, we're now looking at a multi billion pound housing development program and a considerable amount of money being spent on infrastructure. And in England and Wales, obviously, they're going for the, the change standard that you don't want us to see adopt here. Yet, for the sheer size and volume of those products, and and indeed, sort of the production that will be ongoing, I'm pretty certain that the insurance industry is particularly taking a view on this, and is probably already establishing the fact that uh, particular buildings have to be built to particular standards, or else they won't actually get insurance as they go forward. So, you, as in the manufacturing sector, are obviously going to have to look and see how you service that market. Because if the insurance industry and the size of the market is now stating that that's the way they need to go to. So if that is the case, why aren't you planning to repurpose to do that? Because the, just this, sort of the sheer economics of it would suggest that that would be the, sort of the most obvious outcome if you would like to do it as well. Um, the second point is that Northern Ireland doesn't have a very good um, track record in derogating from rules that have come from England and Wales on a whole variety of things. And when it comes to combustible materials, we're not particularly good when it comes to RHI boilers and other bits and pieces. 
and the level of knowledge and information that we normally have for derogation is fairly limited. So obviously, I can see you smiling there, Alan. I can understand why, Chris. Uh, the, reality, the reality here is that if England and Wales are doing something, we need to have a very, very good reason not to do it. And my final point is, speaking as somebody who is unfortunately, as having been in the Royal Navy for um, sort of 30 odd years and fought more than a fair number of fires uh, that have been caused in apparently completely incombustible material that turned out to be very combustible, uh, you know, there are real concerns about and when the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service tell us their concerns, we as a committee take them particularly seriously. So just could you uh, address some of those points there uh, uh, as, your as your final comments, please? Yes, OK. I would pick them up in, in order, if, if that's OK. On the first point, I think we came to you today and we said we have a shared objective with the fire service and with the committee to provide buildings that are safe for their occupants, uh, for the community and for firefighters. And that remains our overarching position. Um, we would believe that the products, when tested and demonstrable proof exists, that they are safe in a large 8414 British standard test, that those products are fit and suitable for purpose. Um, and while we note that England and Wales did bring forward a ban on combustibles. I noted earlier in, in our initial comments the number of countries that utilize British standard 8414 or other similar large-scale system tests, um, including the US, Canada, Sweden, Germany, Belgium, France, the UAE, and Australia, and New Zealand. So a large number of countries still rely heavily on large-scale system testing. Um, and believe that that is a robust way of demonstrating um, fire safety. Um, I think that touches the answer on all three three points. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to say anything? Chris, on. Well, I mean, perhaps I can I can try and pick up some of these themes. Um, firstly, the insurance industry um, ebbs and flows according to its attitude to risk. Uh, what we have found, another one of the unintended consequences of the ban, is that insurers are failing to insure, um, lenders are failing to lend money against buildings which are well below the 18 metre threshold which we are discussing today and which are, are made of products which are not um, ACM cladding as well. So there's a deep discussion to be had with the insurance industry about attitude to risk. And in, uh, in England, just in the last month, um, they've come up with a new uh, scheme, essentially, where government is underwriting some of the risk in order to enable people to move house. The, if we could find ways to bring the insurance industry in as principal stakeholders at an early stage, and if the ins insurance industry was willing to consult with us uh, and with yourselves about its attitude to risk and its attitude to the building estate uh, across Northern Ireland in, a, in an open manner, um, that would be extremely useful for all of us. We know of occasions where um, work has been given the go-ahead for remediation of ACM-clad uh, high-rise buildings in England, uh, and the, the contractors have not been able to get professional indemnity insurance to enable them to start work on the building, because the insurance industry is risk-averse because there is an ACM-clad product on it. So it, it's, it's not a monochrome issue. It's a, it's a very complex issue, and it requires requires um, a, a good degree more transparency from all the stakeholders, I would say. Um, may, I, may I just make a point? Um, yeah, my members are not really not involved in putting a lot of our products on high-rise residential buildings. Our, our core business is, um, is industrial and, and wholesale buildings, um, commercial buildings like car dealerships, but quite a lot of mixed um, residential and, and retail buildings uh, of, of a low-rise nature. And what we find, um, I think Alan made the point at the beginning, is that if there is uncertainty in the marketplace, you will tend to get a specification default 
um, which which goes well beyond the intention of the the legislation. So you know there there are very serious implications for the costs, the time taken to build, uh, the insurance risks associated with um, starts and refurbs as a result of of taking a suboptimal um, decision. The last point, if I may, um, one of the things I've noticed since Grenfell is that so much of the discussion in the industry is about the idea of fire coming into houses from outside. Um, because that's what happened at Grenfell. Absolutely now, inside, you gentlemen will know, I'm right. sure, and just to look at the FRS statistics will tell you, the vast majority of fires do not start from the outside and find their way in. They start with a drop dog end or a shorted television circuit or something. They, they start within the house, which is filled with flammable contents. And then those flammable contents lead to a conflagration which breaks out typically through a window. And that's why you have the 8414 test to give you that certainty of how the products outside will perform in the event of a fire. Uh, I just went back through NIFRS's um, major incidents log uh, just this morning. I, I can't find any evidence of any fire that started on the outside of a building and subsequently compromised people on the inside. They tended to start on the inside and then permeate their way through fire stopping or, or penetrations inside the building. So my only argument here would be we need to have a sense of perspective and proportion about this. We cannot legislate to stop people bringing flammable products into their homes. Um, and, you know, it, to my astonishment, um, I was on a, on a European conference uh, two weeks ago and the Dutch were talking about what a good idea it would be if we had smoke alarms, uh, consumer awareness and flame retardants in our furniture. So um, you know, it's not all bad. Uh, the UK actually is, is leading in terms of um, understanding uh, of, of fire risk, but we need to be proportionate. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And uh, sir, Fergal, Alan and Chris, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And the one thing I can assure you is that your evidence today has really sort of informed the decision-making process of this committee. And for that, I thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, okay, team, thank just you. A... Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, it was mentioned during the evidence session about talking to UCAS. Uh, which is at uh, oral evidence session for UCAS and from Jordanstown. I think, bearing in mind what we've just heard, I particularly want to hear that evidence. And are you content as a committee that we reach out to them to come and yeah. give us evidence? Yeah. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if we move on to um, item number six on the agenda, oral presentation from Rays on the analysis of forecast outturn quarterly report. Oh, we. Over. Oh. Colin, are you there? I'm here. Chris? Hey. Welcome, Chris. Hello. Th thank you very much indeed for joining Reyes, and we promise we'll be very gentle on you for at least one session. <laughs> Chris has just joined uh, joined Reyes, and this is his first time in front of the front of the committee. Okay, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, raise briefing papers on proactive committee use of departmental forecasting and outturn data is on page 186, and the briefing uh, paper on outturns uh, pilot commentary for autumn 2020 is on page 206. Colin, can you crack on, please? Yes, I will be. Um, I'll, I'll be brief uh, because I want to give as much time as possible to to Chris, if that's okay. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> In short, these data have been knocking around the committee for some time, um, and we've always known that they are important in RAISE, and, and the members have always known they're important, but it's really only now we're getting to the stage where we can um, find a useful way of uh, presenting them and interrogating them that should be useful to the committees. Um, so we have better tools at our disposal, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Um, so in the briefing paper, we have highlighted how we think these data can now be used um, to support committees in their budget rate related roles and responsibilities and encourage a more proactive, holistic, and possibly even, I might venture to say, sort of data and evidence driven approach to budget scrutiny. Um, 
So on page 189 of your packs, just in the introduction to the paper, we've said that essentially what we're trying to do is, is support committees when they're engaging in the whole of the budget cycle, not just piecemeal. Um, and uh, to show how these data may be used um, to support those advisory and scrutiny roles and responsibilities. Um, so just to, to recap on what these data are, because I know members have seen them before and they come in uh, monthly from the department. Um, the, uh, the forecast data is essentially two parts. There's a forecast, which is the, the best estimate of how much a department will spend um, in each month for the remainder of the current financial year. And then the second set of information is the outturn which is, in effect, the monthly profile showing the expenditure that has already been incurred in the months past. Um, so those two pieces of information are separate, but can be combined then to create a sort of uh, an analysis of, of the accuracy of the forecasting. Um, I just would also like to highlight quickly page uh, 191 of your packs, the, the little diagram, which shows the, the uses of departmental data. And this is where it's really important for the committees to, to see that this data can be helpful and this dashboard can be helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you see the little blue box off to the right, which says the OF uses up towards the top of the diagram. Mm -hmm. um, in essence, DOF uses these data to um, make their plans for um, the budget exchange returns, which is to do with the carryover of unused resources at the end of the year. So that, these data inform that um, process. And that's obviously important for trying to manage the block and make sure that resources uh, aren't lost to Northern Ireland by um, an excessive amount of, of unspent uh, capital money, for example, building up and, and not being able to be carried over. So that's important. There's also the, the way that they can be used to inform the monitoring rounds. Um, and there is an issue here for committees in that there is a, and we, we've set it out in the paper, there is this inevitable sort of time lag in the data and when it can become available. So one of the real challenges for this pilot is to, for us to work out in conjunction with committees and committee staff how we best time that uh, the outputs in order to support that engagement between um, committees and, and the, depart uh, the department officials. Um, and then the final, the final point there is about borrowing. Um, and, you know, the use of, of forecasting, obviously, and, and whether money is spent or not spent, will inform the executive's decision making when it comes to deciding its borrowing strategy for future years. If capital is slipping from one, you know, in a program from one year into the next or one month into the next, it may well have impacts on, or for example, whether or not the department needs to draw down the full amount of borrowing or whether it doesn't, um, and so on. So um, those are really the, the, the important framing points. Um, what I'm going to do is pass you over to Chris now, who's going to demonstrate the new dashboard and take you through the, the commentary that we've we piloted. Um, and I would just ask, sorry, I should have said this at the beginning, if we can, because because we are really tight on time, um, if we can keep questions until after Chris has done his demonstration, that would be that would be helpful. Thank you. Yep. Cheers. Thanks, Colin. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I'll just share my screen with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, this dashboard um, is intended to look, as Colin said, at uh, forecast expenditure and uh, actual expenditure of the departments. Um, it looks at capital and resource. Uh, so this is based on departmental uh, spend info um, that the Department of Finance send us each month. Um, they also send that to uh, Treasury and they also send it to the ONS as well as part of their, it feeds into their uh, statistics gathering. Uh, this covers uh, the current financial year, so from April 2020 until March 2021. <clears throat> so the most recent data we have for it is for September 
Uh, now there is a little bit of lag, uh, again as Colin mentioned, so although September is the most recent information we have for uh, actual spend or outturn, um, we, we got that in October, so when we get October's information it will probably be later, um, later in this month. Uh, but overall the aim of this is really just to present this information from the department in an accessible um, and interactive way um, and ideally via the committee in its, in its scrutiny role um, at each stage of the budget cycle. So there's two main parts to it. Um, there's an expenditure profile, which is what's on the screen at the moment, and there's a forecast performance uh, section as well, which I'll move on to. Um, so we'll start with the expenditure profile. And broadly, it's split by capital, which is on the top half of the page here, and resource, which is on the bottom. Um, so if we look at the top left here, we've got a, a spend profile for, for uh, capital spending and um, capital budget. And we can just see by month uh, what the profile looks like. Um, and the idea is that this, this might help with within year monitoring. Um, so we can see the spend profile, um, how smooth it is, or if there's any risk of underspend or surge at year end, for example. Um, so to the right of that then, we have some key some key figures, key metrics. Um, at the top, we've got what uh, has been spent of the capital budget so far um, up to September. Um, and then we've got the total budget for the year underneath that, the 1.6 billion. Um, and from that, we can tell um, what proportion of the budget has been spent so far. You can see there the 24.5%. Um, that's the proportion that's been spent um, as of September, um, at a point we're about halfway through the year. Um, third down there, um, projected spend by year end. So that's what, given the expenditure so far um, to September, plus what's forecast to be spent by departments for the rest of the year, what, um, what we're likely to see spent um, over the year. So that gives us the 102% of the budget um, projected to be spent there at the bottom. Now, obviously, that we can't have an overspend, but um, the point of this really is to is to highlight that, um, and then you know we can ask the question: what sort of what sort of measures departments might take uh, to rein that in over the year or by year end? Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that this was to show things in a more dynamic way. Um, so it's not a slide. We can move things around and, uh, and interact with the information a little bit. So we've got some uh, buttons over here just to select different departments. So we've got the nine ministerial departments and then six non-ministerial. So today we'll just focus on the, the ministerial ones in the interest of time. So if I wanted to interact with this and say, look at the Department of Infrastructure, I can select that and we'll see our information change here, um, which is relevant to the Department for Infrastructure. Um, or I can look at, uh, say, individual months. So I can pick September here and see the information for September. Or I can also look at the actual data that's behind this. So rather than just looking at the table or the chart itself, I might want to look at some of the information on lies underneath it. Uh, so the bottom half of the page is exactly the same, except for resource. So um, I guess some of the some of the points that might help the committee in its scrutiny role. So if we, you know, uh, if we were to look at the bottom right here, you know, the bottom middle, we can see there's a projected uh, proportion of spend here for resource of 101.7%. Um, now again, like I said, that we're not allowed to overspend, but um, it's it might be useful just to be able to see. Um, you know, if there is a sort of slight overspend forecast for the year, um, we can we can highlight that, and at least it's a way of it's a way of flagging this to members or the committee that um, there might be a question that needs asked or something uh, something else looked up. Um, so if we wanted to see, you know, how different how different departments, uh, for example, vary that that 101.7 percent is a is an average. So infrastructure, for example. That's 110 percent, but the executive office is below 100 um, percent. Or, for example, if we pick Department for Finance, we can see in capital um, a bit of a surge forecast for March, um, and only 10 percent of the capital budget spent at this point of the year, um, six months into the year, and 75 percent likely to be spent by the end of the year. So again, um, maybe raises the question of is there a risk of an underspend there? Um, and the same sort of information down here for resource. Uh, 
so we can see that roughly 45 percent of the budget for resources has been spent uh, so far this year um, and <clears throat> that kind of covers the expenditure profile uh, part of things um, so i'm just going to move on to the the forecast performance and when i say when I say forecast performance, what that actually means is the comparison of what departments have said they're uh, forecasting the spend versus what they actually spent. So again, we've broken this by capital and resource. Um, and on the left, the top left here, you can see, and this is for the month of September. So a forecast performance of 100%, as we've got, uh, we've got here on the right or in the middle, that would suggest that the departments spent exactly what it forecasts for that month of September. If it's slightly higher, so for DFE, the 129% suggests there's a slight overspend. Um, to the right here, we've got cumulative. So that's basically the same indicator but on an average from April to September. So that'll smooth out any um, sort of one-off variances you know, if you have a month where there's a significant under overspend. Um, so we get a clearer picture of the year so far. Um, You'll notice it's quite colourful. Um, there is a reason. It's really just so that if we pick multiple departments, um, it's, it's easier to compare them against each other. So DERA, we've got the, the green. Uh, if we want to include the, part of the economy, it just, it just makes comparison easier. Um, but again, we've got the same measures, but for resource underneath here. Um, you can see in resource here they're all they're all fairly accurate and um, there is one here you'll notice the executive office there's a very big difference um, now we're not actually sure why that is um, we, don't, we don't have the information at the moment to answer that but the purpose i guess of this is to point to the fact that there is such a variance and that there may be a question to ask um, i think in this case there was a forecast spend of around seven and a half million but the actual outturn for september was around minus 15. Um, so again, it's the point is to highlight and help and help the department in its in its scrutiny rule. Um, so that's that's quite a quick overview um, of why this works. There's there's a commentary um, in the packs. I think it's at page two hundred and nine onwards, and it talks through just some of the interpretations of how this works. Um, but but the intention is that um, when as and when data becomes available. Um, it can be updated. It'll go online on the, the RAISE website after this meeting, if that's okay. Um, and it'll just be hosted there. So as as new information becomes available from the department, um, it'll just be a quick process of updating it. So it'll be live and the, the committee or members will be able to look at, um, at their leisure, really. So if there's any questions or any, uh, any feedback, um, I'm happy to take those. Yeah, just a, I've got, actually quite a few questions have come out of it. Um, First question is, looking at that, it's very easy to see where, particularly when, in effect, you're doing monitoring rounds for them. But you can actually monitor very closely on a month on by basis. So the question is, you know, the quality of the data coming in, and if all the departments are feeding directly into this, there should be no excuse for delays in monitoring rounds, or indeed, uh, you could look very carefully if you and imagine there's a very easy merged data uh, system. Where you can actually look at sort of the overall potential uh, outturns and outruns, and then look at sort of where the overall monitoring round would give us at a fairly easy sort of uh, check at, on a you know on a monthly basis. Because if the if the data of this is, is accurate, we don't need uh, we're getting the information that we need, and we need it on a monthly basis, which I think is something that is uh, very good news. Um, the second point is. I would be extraordinarily surprised at the civil service itself, and particularly with the perm sex, who are all supposed to be accounting officers, don't have something similar. And if they don't have something similar, I think we need to ask a question of why they don't. And I think the flow of the information, I think, must come through the committees to be able to see that. that and I hate using the word granularity, but I will use it. That degree of granularity of the information coming through, I think, it is very important because that gives us a very fast ready reckoner of where we're likely to be to, to, to see what, what we're trying to do as well. So for that, I sort of, um, indeed, I think that's a, an, impress, an impressive piece of work. Um, but I think that's something that all the committees need to be on top of and to be able to see that. Because if we're getting the monthly flow of information to populate the, this, the data sets, 
and we're able to look at that. If we can do that level of information, there's no reason why the committees can't be able to get much further uh, information of the finances as they're coming through. And I think that's a vital too for MLAs and these scrutiny committees themselves. But thank you yes, for a good piece. Um, it's, it's a relatively simple process, very, very simple process of updating and making sure that it's current with whatever um, the most available data is. So um, it's, it's, sort of, it's dependent on how quickly receive, we receive the information. I mean, we can we can include a lot more granularity, as you said, um, than is already in there. So we can look within department, but if we were able to look at you know even further particular programs or anything, that that can be added. So it's um, yeah, it's, it's sort of limited just by how, how timely um, uh, receipt of the data is really. And I think the other thing would be quite useful as well is if the arms length bodies are having to report on a monthly basis as well. That gives us a better uh, idea of the sort of the flow and control and the accounting processes of the arms length bodies, particularly something like health, where a lot of its money goes straight out the door into the various sort of trusts, and sometimes it's difficult monitoring how the trusts are spending it. But if we had that yeah. degree of information as well, that would give us more information. Uh, sorry. Paul. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, this is excellent. Uh, I like the look at this. Um, and I look forward to being able to use it and delve into the different departments. Um, but I suppose the question is, it's only as good as the data that's in it. Uh, and, and, and the question I put is, how are you getting that data? Uh, are you getting it through MLA questioning? Are you getting it through committee packs? Are you getting it through your own right by asking the ministers and the departments yourself as a, as, as a unit called RAISE? How, how can we be sure that the information on it will be up to date and accurate? Um, yeah, thank you. So that the information that uh, feeds into this, um, essentially, as provided by the Department of Finance. Um, so my understanding is that it's it's collated by them. So we we would get it in one in one uh, spreadsheet, essentially, um, and it will have the most recent. Month, so it'll look like a look like a list of all the departments, um, ministerial and non-ministerial, and then months, and then we'll have the the budgets and the projected the projected spend and things that are in here. So it's it's a sort of consolidated, aggregated data set that we receive from the Department of Finance um, each month, or as, as 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 soon as we can get it, really after after the data is collated by them. And and is that some sort of Memorandum of understanding, or is that some sort of standard operating procedure that's in place? Um, it's it's really a, it's sort of a I wouldn't say it's a memorandum of understanding, but it's more of a it, it, we've requested it for the purposes of, of compiling um, both, both this uh, this dashboard and and the the commentary and the analysis that, that Colin talked about and what's in your in your packs. So it's it's sort of really just based on a on a request to the department for. Uh, for the information that we needed to do the to do the analysis. If I, if I can just cut in there, yeah. um, the, the committee has been receiving these data for a long time. And there was a, there was a break during the during the period when devolution wasn't operating, but we it's only recently that we have been able to get access to the data in in spreadsheet form and and have had the skills and the time to actually develop this this dashboard uh, approach. Um, so that's why. This this has now come at this stage. You know the the data have actually been in existence for a long time, but the trouble is that we don't have a we don't have a long time series because of departmental reorganisation at one one point, and then because we've got this big uh, gap in the data. Um, <clears throat> so it may be that I, I'm sure because because DOF has to provide that data to um, to Treasury. It exists somewhere um, whether or not we can get hold of it, it's a different matter but it would be good to have it you know over a longer time period so we can see the trends that emerge um, and a uh, chair can I pick up on the question that you you said about the granularity uh, you used that term is it we would actually like to see data below the the level of the individual department because yeah. um, we can see obviously we can see how a whole department is doing but if we could get information below that level but but that that's something that um dof have said they don't get it in that form uh so in order for us to go um 
to get more yeah is they say at the level of whatever the expect the um, estimates headings are or something like that. it depends whether it's unit of business or or how the departments actually aggregate this uh, in the first place um would take a, a process of us actually having to go to the individual departments as i understand it but um that, that's something that we hope to explore a bit more during this sort of pilot project period just just on that because that's a very very good question if you have some sort of relationship we'll call it that with the department of finance at the present time there's no reason why you couldn't have with all the other departments and they all furnish you with the information on a monthly basis yeah that's not pie in the sky sure it's not Colin. um well the point is that we have we're getting this information from the department of finance because they they're the ones with the responsibility for feeding the information to treasury so they have it in the central yes. point and then they're forwarding it on to the treasury. So, um, if I suppose if we were if we were to ask, yeah, in theory, yes, I, I'm sure we could we could we could ask the question, um, or maybe it's something that needs to be done through committees. Or I, I it, it's really something that we need to we need to sort of bottom out over this over this period. And as we gather fight feedback, I mean, one of the issues is is whether members actually think it would be useful to have more detail because. Uh, one on, of the things on, about given. <laughs> yeah okay because there's always a balance to be struck between providing information and providing too much information that nobody's actually got the time, time or capacity to take in now with the dashboard the beauty of that is that it's quite quick and because it's visual you should be able to to take in what's quite a complicated data set fairly quickly yeah and that's why i like the dashboard because because the time issue here is is trying to troll through things and, and information to try and get relevant information mm -hmm. but if it's in a dashboard form it's there at your fingertips very very quickly and you know that it will all be uniform and you, it's all comparable uh, and and that's why i think that it's good it would be good if we could expand I, I get the point that the department of finance is the one who's responsible for creating this going to the treasury and then that's where you get your high level your bar charts but to populate the bars, I think if we ha have an engagement with the other departments, and like, who, what other department would, would actually refuse this uh, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the guise of openness and transparency? To me, this is a very good thing. So yeah, I'm 100% I'm behind it, and I think it would be very, very good. And it'll be a very good tool for, I think, increasing the awareness and the education for MLA sitting in other committees mm -hmm. that, that, that have responsibilities and priorities in in some areas and in the finance side of things maybe slip mm -hmm. uh, i think it would be a good way of keeping up the information levels of all committees the other thing about looking at the data sets and how easy and it's obviously the engine behind it but when you merge the data sets you'll also be able to look at trends yep and i think the useful bit particularly if we got granularity that terrible word again of the next level down that will show if there's a particular trend within a department in a particular area that is adding to the overall trend and pace of the rest of it. An early oversight of that, particularly in sort of the higher spending departments like health or education, should give an indication to the assembly where we need to be focusing our efforts and either getting more resource to it or looking at what's what's behind those issues. But the problem at the moment, we don't get that until well after the event. But if that data is coming in monthly, we should be able to sort of drill down into that. I think Paul, are you happy? Yep, that's me. Thank you, Chair. Jim? Uh, just uh, very useful. <laughs> I'm intrigued as to who made the selection about which department got which colour. But uh, I suppose that hopefully that's just random. <laughs> well, one, one, thing, one thing I did notice was, um, <laughs> has it already shown up an issue of concern that on the capital spend, whilst we're well through, halfway through the financial year, only 20, less than a quarter of that budget has been spent? Meanwhile, on the resource end of things, we're actually more or less on track. Is that a warning sign that it already has shown up, is that unless the departments get their act together, they will not be able to spend their capital allocation this year? I don't think you will. Um, yeah, so I think it's hard, hard I suppose, can't really comment on you know, what department's plans are, but I, th I think the, the purpose of it is to hide there's some variation within uh, within that. So although there's a quarter here, there might be 
some departments will have spent a lot more than that and some less. And I suppose the the purpose of the the aspiration of this is that it it provides the committee or committees with with a way of actually diving into it and finding into the detail and you know having a way of seeing which departments are causing that. So there may be some that are you know putting that average down. Um, and some that are on the other side of it as well. So it's more it's more a way of sort of equipping members of the committee or other committees um, to ask those questions. Do we know? Can we identify at this stage which were the department where there's an area of concern? Is there some major project out there that you know the community are very keen to see start, and for some reason it's being held back? Uh, can can um, we identify that at this stage oh. using that? That data. Chair, can I just can I just come in on that point about uh, when we looked at this this concept of uh, year end surging a few years ago, where the the, the profile is sort of back loaded in the year. Now, <clears throat> Colin, I think, it's, I think you've got a female burglar there behind you. Oh yeah, that's uh, yes, that's Mrs. Pigeon. <laughs> um, uh, um, <laughs> uh, Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Now. Um, <laughs> the, um, so year-end surging is, is a phenomenon in public expenditure. It, it, it happens now in capital. It may be partly that departments plan to spend their money at the end of the year. We, we, we can't answer that at the moment. Um, but what we can do is point to it happening. Um, the other issue is that because we're looking at 2020 or 2020, 21 the financial year is that because of the whole lockdown period um, and the pauses to the normal operations of government it may be that that some of this stuff has got pushed back um, towards the end of the year in a way that is unusual um, we would only really be able to see that if we had a had a sort of number of years data to compare it Colin, um, so it may, may be a planning Sorry, tool. Colin. Could we look? Could we look back? And I know I don't want to chuck you extra work, but could we look back historically and look maybe of our uh, previous couple of years? Because it, in many respects, this is great. Uh, this is a great piece of work, but it's not, a, as you just pointed out, it's not a natural baseline to work from. Is there any way we could look back maybe two to three years so we actually have that as well? So that might add to the uh, that might add to the data sets because obviously the big difference with this as well there's an extra 2.8 billion in the in the pot that wouldn't have been there and maybe in some respects is a lot of departments are using that to manage uh, their budgets in a way that they uh, wouldn't have had to um, in relation to the data going back um, because the, the, the flow of data has always been from the Department of Finance to the Committee of, for Finance. Yeah. And it's only recently that we, we've been getting it directly. Um, so during that period when the committee and the assembly, <laughs> he's trying to sneak it under these now. Um, <laughs> the, that period when the, uh, the, the assembly wasn't meeting, that flow of information stopped in terms of it coming to the committee obviously because the committee wasn't wasn't meeting so um if we go back to beyond before that period then we're, we're in almost into the the territory when there were more departments and so the the data aren't okay the spending remits aren't the same if you see what i mean okay uh, thanks thanks welcome yeah uh, thanks chair and just on the back of steve's uh, the chairman's point uh, it's the information, it's either to Chris or Colin, that information would, could it be put to better use if we were working off a three-year budget? <sighs> Looking forward. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that as well. Um, Chair, I mean, the, the issue is, yes, if, if you're looking at um, the year-end expenditure, and how it might roll into the following year. So if you're trying to look at the, the cycle as a whole, which is what we're trying to encourage, you know, the uh, committees to do, then that would be easier to do if you had a, if you had a, a longer planning horizon, if you like, um, so a multi-annual budget. But the important issue on that is, has been raised not that long ago by the finance minister 
um, and his counterparts in the other devolved administrations is that actually a multi-annual budget is only really extra useful if you can carry resources over if there's been if you can't spend this year because of whatever there's planning problems with a capital project if you're allowed to carry it over to the following year then that's that's better than having to obviously hand the resources back or spend them on a lower priority project mm -hmm. uh, one of the most notable features of that combined uh, expenditure monthly expenditure is the profile of the land departments in that period the dramatic surge in capital for March 2021, following more moderate but still pronounced increases in January and February, uh, this is I know it is due to trying to spend their money, their capital, and does it always occur in the forecasts? Uh, did this surge exist in the spring forecast? Did you notice that when you were looking at it as well? And should departments not try? I mean, it's probably it's probably more for the committee, and we should be pushing them to prevent this surge and therefore uh, risk of unspent funds. A lot of questions, but when you're minding the chat as well. Um, I, I can sort of answer that briefly. Um, Colin has anything else to add, but um, I suppose just on on your first point, um, yeah. So we, the way we would receive this information um, is monthly. So what was last month? So in. August, what was a forecast becomes an actual, and then what was forecast in September becomes an actual in October and so on. So that surge being uh, in March or even January, February, March, um, in the past couple of iterations of the data we've seen, um, it is, it's still there. Uh, we, we haven't got the data as far back um, as April uh, to hand. So I'm not sure if it's still there, if it becomes more pronounced um, as the year goes on, but uh, Certainly, in the last couple of iterations of what we've seen, there's it's, there's still quite a lot of it um, backloaded into February, March, especially March. Just a quick one: when we report, when the when the Department of Finance reports to the Treasury, and the Treasury has to uh, publish the data, does the Treasury ever uh, come back to the Department of Finance and say there's a variation here, or uh, do they actually ask? Do they, do they actually interrogate the data the Department of Finance gives them? Um, Chair, I think that's a question for the Department of Finance. Yeah. Um, I, I, my, my guess is that yes, they do. Yeah. Sorry, I I would say I would say they do. Yeah, I, I wish Matthew was here for that because I remember at some stage in the past Treasury coming back to uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the Department of Finance and questioning some of the sort of some of the sort of the figures and the methodology has been used and how and there was a some degree of variance and indeed I think uh, one of the previous Secretary of State's reported that there was a variance of sometimes up to something like a hundred million, uh, which seems to be an awful lot. Um, I just think think it uh, that might just be this would be an interesting tool to have, but I think that's just an excellent piece of work, and I think all of us here in the committee yeah. and can sort of commend both of you for your your very hard work and pointing out the fact that you've got a lot more hard work to do. But then, such as such as uh, such as life. Uh, any other final questions? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thanks everybody. Well, thank you. Uh, could I have your yeah. approval as the committee? I would like to circulate these two raised papers to the statutory committees. Uh, to support their budget scrutiny and to publish the papers on the Assembly website. Are we content? Yes. I'd also probably like to write to the um, Chairperson's Liaisons Group, uh, informing them of this good work that we've done. And I'd also probably like to write on behalf of the committee to the other committees to say, you know, here's a very interesting tool that we think you should be using and we'd like you to join with us and sort of uh, making sure that the departments do it. And maybe we can info it to the, uh, the departments as well. So they are fully aware of our request and what we're trying to do, if we're content on that. Content? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I move on to agenda number, uh, number seven, uh, statute rule 2020, number 280, the administration of a state small payments increase of limit order 2020. Clark's brief is page 225. And the administration of state small payments increase of limit order 2020 it's page 226. Uh, the committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 21st of October and noted the positive response to the consultation process from the Irish League of Credit Unions. 
Moussa, do you want to sort of um, say anything at this stage? Other than, as I said on a previous occasion as well, to I know exactly uh, the position that the League of Credit Unions have adopted in this respect, and I'd agree with it entirely as well, too, and that given just uh, the difficulties that people can face, especially at the time of death and the likes of it. And with, uh, but now it would be regarded as relatively small holdings in the credit union that they should be able to access it immediately. Okay, thank you. Uh, the purpose of the statutory sure. rule is sorry. just on that point. Uh, um, I, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but I also I have to check with my wife. I'm a member of the credit union. Yeah. 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 So. And I also would like to put on record uh, right now. I think that the credit unions across sort of Northern Ireland have done an, an excellent job. And bearing in mind um, the inability of some people to access credit that they need from the banking system. I think the credit unions should be commended for their hard work, particularly in these particular difficult times. If we are all agreed, great. Uh, the purpose of the statutory rule is to increase the small payments limit from 10,000 to 20,000 on the amount of money that may be released to the beneficiaries of a deceased person from that person's estate by certain organisations without the need for a grant of probate. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure of the Assembly and shall not come into operation until affirmed by the Assembly. Is the intention of the Minister to move the motion on the floor of the Assembly on the 7th of December 2020? There has been no change to the policy in the statutory rule since it was considered by the Committee at the SL1 stage, and the examiner's statutory rules as reported on SR 2020-280 in the report of examiner of statutory rules to the Assembly and the appropriate committee's 32nd report of session 2019-2020, dated 27th of November 2020. It's on page 346 and has recorded no comment. May I seek the agreement from the members? Are we agreed? Therefore, if the members agree, state that the Committee for Finance has considered Statutory Rule 2020 Number 280, the Administration of Estates, Small Payments, Increase of Limit Order 2020, and has no objection to that rule. Agreed? Agreed. agreed. All agreed. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, item number eight, written evidence, Northern Ireland Audit Office Report, Managing Attendance in Central and Local Government. Uh, for members, the Northern Ireland Audit, Audit Office report managing attendance in central and local government is at page 234. Any comments? Chair, I'd like to say I think it's, it's quite a shocking read that the rates of sickness absence in the civil service in Northern Ireland is higher than anywhere else in the United Kingdom, that our local councils are consistently the highest in the UK, and that we are talking about needing a principle of developing and promoting a strong attendance culture. I think that's quite shocking in terms of our public service. Whatever the exceptional reasons for some people, it's quite clear that there is a culture which is not a, a good one of high levels of sickness absence. And uh, just for record, I was quoted, I think, in the Belfast Telegraph, or I'm about to be quoted in the Belfast Telegraph, depending on what stage that the, sort of the media process is going on. And it was a question about the fact that the level, since a uh, lockdown and sort of the COVID restrictions have yes. come in, the levels of sickness within the civil service and local government, I believe, oh. have gone down and have gone down significantly. 31 per cent. Or 31 per cent. <laughs> Not quite sure if I remember that particular well, statistic, it, it, but it was, it was. It was very interesting. I, in a previous life, I, I was in charge of 28 staff, half of whom were permanent, and half of whom were already paid just doing the same role. The permanent staff got paid no matter whether they came in or not. They already paid, only got paid if they came in. Why was the sickness rate 14 times higher in the permanent staff than they already paid doing the same job? There is a question. It must be down to the leadership you show, Jim, obviously. Uh, Pat, you want to come in there? Yes, sir. This is a pretty incredible report from the Audit Office. Um, I see 273,000 working desks, but rather than back the earth for everyone in order to read into it, I just wanted to go to one little piece in it, and it's the mental health conditions are a prominent cause of the long term sickness. 102,000 working days were lost due to anxiety, anxiety stress, and depression. Uh, that's on 2019 20. 
So, I mean, some of the statistics and some of the long-term absentees accounts are for over three quarters of the working days lost in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and um, I, uh, really should do better and needs to be better, and we need to look at the reasoning for this. And I've already pulled out that one on 102,000 working days were lost due to anxiety, stress, and depression. There's something, there's something seriously amiss, and there's something wrong there. Um, bearing in mind that as one of our significant areas of work is in public sectors reform, I think we should get we should have this report back in front of us again, yeah. and we shall look at it when we are doing our area in public sector reform. If we are content, content. chairperson of business is no chairperson of business. Correspondence: uh, Matthew is not here to talk about the committee for communities regarding licensing and registration of clubs amendment call for evidence. But has any other member got any comments? Are we happy to note? So noted. Uh, sir, uh, I, I, I don't have anything done on that, but I do want to say that I visited the, the, we're talking on the, the new licensing as proposed. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, I'd say that. That's all right. It's, it's nothing uh, to do with. I, I understand that Matthew wanted to make a formal proposal regarding the bill. Oh, that's all right. I haven't, I'm got, any, I haven't got any information on it. So I'm quite happy to take out his business for next week. Right. Uh, we're content. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the uh, next item of correspondence, Department update regarding Dormant Accounts Fund, page 293. This was to remind members this was deferred from last week's meeting. Jim, that was you, wasn't it? Is it the, the bank? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to say that, uh, you know, this is, is an interesting development. I wondered, is there any mechanism where we can be kept up to date of committee uh, as to the rollout of this and the payments made? It offers an opportunity for those organisations who wouldn't necessarily accept lottery money to take the dormant bank account money. This is money that's been lying in accounts for years, sometimes a very mm. dubious background and hasn't been claimed. So the, the department can now seize it and if people do eventually come along and explain where it's come from, then they can have it, but they don't get too many knocks on their doors. But this, this does offer a fresh form of funding to organisations like churches who don't wish to take lottery money. Some churches do, some churches don't. Um, but isn't the recommendation that dormant accounts money will go to the National Lottery uh, Fund? Yeah, yes, but of course, I think the Church's argument is that it, it might be administered by the National Lottery, but it's not but it's gambling money. Yeah. I think that's the, the distinction as not to what, who administered as the source of it. Uh, and I think, for instance, the Presbyterian Church in Northern Ireland doesn't take yeah, lottery okay, money. Yeah. Church of Ireland does, they'll take anything, but the Church of Presbyterians <laughs> don't. Um, Roman Catholics do. Baptists don't. So that's, it's, it's a variation there, and therefore the, those churches have been locked out. I need to make a declaration of interest here. As a member of the Church of Ireland, we will desperately take money from anybody wherever we <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, That's it, you see. But you see, the Presbyterians have got principles, uh, and, and they don't take it from, from money that's tainted by gambling. Um, so therefore, uh, they, they, they have not, It's not restricted to organisations who don't take from... No, it's money. not, but it's the only, it's the only cho mm -hmm. chance that they have for instance, for the refurbishment of an historic building, uh, re-roofing of a church or something like that. So you would like to be... Yeah, quarterly, could, could, could we get a quarterly update on what's been going on with that new fund? Because it actually was instigated when Sammy Wilson was Minister of Finance, and that's a very long time ago. Uh, and therefore, it's taken that long for it to wind its way through the system to get to this point. If we're content, I'll write to the, we'll write to the well, department yeah. and ask them for a quarterly update on for the government accounts fund. Thank you. Thank you. Um, bum, bum. A departmental response. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Departmental response regarding expenditure under sole authority of the Budget Act, page three hundred. Anybody got any comment about that? I suppose um, they're telling us how difficult it would be to provide, which may be true. And I suppose when provided, it's only really educating. It's not nothing we can do anything about at that point. I I am sort of if they are remarkably busy and not able to just give us the evidence within the two weeks, I'm more than happy to. 
The one thing we don't want to do is get to the point where we're getting to the draft budget proceedings, and yet again we have another question about sort of sole authority and uh, sort of various black boxes and various other things and the rest of it. So I'm more than willing to give them sort of the rest of the December and early January to do this, because I don't think that there would be any excuse then not to be able to provide the information we would need. I think the committee would think that that would be quite reasonable, given them an uh, increase out to two months, because bearing in mind they're going to have to consider these issues anyhow before we get ready to the next, we're next ready for the next budgetary process. Yeah, yeah, Chair. You know, whilst we scrutinise, we are not unreasonable. So, if the department are writing to us to tell us they need more time, so be it. And, and we we understand priorities. We understand what needs to come first. Uh, and of course, in a finance department, the budget has to come first. So, yeah, absolutely. I have no problems with giving um, the department a bit of latitude on this. Yeah, OK. Are we content? Uh, this is just all we're asking for is written agreement for past approvals of expenditure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it will help inform us our. Because one of the things that's come out through, and one thing we've had, even though we've only been back in existence for hardly a year, we've had lots of opportunities to scrutinise budgets because they come along fairly regularly. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is uh, around the sort of the whole issue of black boxes and black boxes expenditure that, of course, or not non-expenditure that has been raised by members of this committee. So, all we have to do is find them. So it shouldn't be that difficult to find out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ramsey. Chair, members content then for to have the information for PACs for the 29th of January? Would I that? think that would be appropriate. Thank you. Uh, next item is uh, EcoGen report for Solus, NI and Nelga regarding the EU successor funding is at page 302. Um, advise members, the Government has confirmed that details of the Shared Prosperity Fund will be announced following the spending review on the 25th of November and said it intends to use the financial assistance powers in the Internal Market Bill to implement that fund. Members, are we content as Solace and Nilga to provide oral evidence to the Committee in January once more detail is available on the EU successor funding? Okay. Um, uh, from the Department regarding the Chancellor's spending review update on page 314. Any comments? Yes, Chair. Sorry. This is the one where we shouldn't be reasonable on. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is this is the priority. This really should be. These are the, these are the, the golden numbers that the Department was waiting for. Yep. So now that they have them, and now that I'm, sh I'm sure they've done a lot of scoping exercise with regards to what could be numbers, uh, I think it's fair enough for this Department to ask the question, when will we see uh, a budget? Uh, I know that they, their paragraph seven there, the budget process, they say it will, it will now be necessary to conduct a focused budget exercise to provide a draft budget for consideration by the executive as soon as possible. So yes, as soon as possible, what sort of time scale are we talking about? Uh, because this budget will now have to be in place for April. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the process should be a consultation and everything else that comes with it. So I guess I'm asking, when will we see that? First of all, when will we see the budget, the draft budget, and when will we see the plan for launching and consulting on that budget? Yeah, I think we should write to the, the minister and say, look, now we've had this information. We've also seen from the dashboard, we've got a good idea of sort of the, the, the flows. We, we know that they'll have a monthly update, so they'll know exactly what's happening in the monitoring round and where the monitoring round is likely to flow to. So they should be able to give us firm dates when they're going to come to us and explain exactly where they're going with the budgetary process. And indeed, that should help inform the de decision for the other executive departments to get off their proverbials and get ready for the budgetary process as well. And you know, we have had the additional funds. We know the additional funds, but that we have now got. I I think it's highly unlikely we'll get any more in the way of bar consequentials or any changes between now and the, the beginning of the budgetary process when we go through. The only difference to that will likely to be the um, will be the shared prosperity fund and where that sits, but actually that that shouldn't sort of change uh, that shouldn't change the draft budgeting process in any way. Okay. We content. Sorry, Chair, if, if I can say, so members would be aware of the minister's statement yesterday, the written statement yeah. uh, on the spending envelope. Basically, that is he's required to do that two weeks before the draft budget is led. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the earliest date of, of a draft budget would be the 15th of December. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
It probably it's just yesterday in the minister's statement. The minister stated that uh, compliance with guidance has not been uh, entirely consistent. So I suppose I'm, I'm looking at there is 120 million reduction in the FTC in the spending review. I mean, I don't, do, do we know? Do we know why? Or have we asked why? Uh, no, there's no further detail on that. It's we don't know. Have we asked? Oh, yes. No, yeah, we've just seen it. Are we going to ask, Chair? I think we will do. Thank you. Yeah, and Chair, just to, just to clarify the, the the 14 days issue, that's that's at least 14 days. So the minister doesn't have to bring it 14 days time, you know. And I I don't know if that's reasonable even to suggest that. But I, what I'm looking for is a sort of timeline and, and forecast yep. as to when it should be here. But we should be the sort of the department should be looking at the budget. It should have already been looked at the budget process, Absolutely. and the final stage is before December. Is that there should be the sort of the draft spending priority should be in front of the executive for agreement, so an outline, so they're getting ready for sort of uh, sort of uh, the committees to start work on it in sort of January and February time. Okay, uh, if we move on to the next uh, item of correspondence, uh, department response regarding. Role and remit, remit of independent fiscal institutions on in page 316. Just for acknowledging our yeah. raise paper. Yeah. If we're content uh, to forward to raise for information, agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, seek agreement to note any remaining items of correspondence. Yeah. I want to draw members' attention to the information request of the Department on page 324. The Department has requested an extension to the correspondence on the queries and related to VAT on goods and PPE equipment, which is due this week. The Department is still awaiting input from outside the Department. I think we can all express our frustrations at having no information whatsoever about what is going to happen from 1 January 2021. And I, I, I fully appreciate the fact that the department can't answer a question that they don't have any answers to yet. Um, I'd like to further inform members our request regarding response due to the annual progress report to the Equalities Commission on the 26th of November. The department requires input from a number of business areas, and officials have asked for a two-week extension with a view to providing it sooner if possible. Uh, could I have your agreement to extend the response due on 26th of November out for a further two weeks? Great. Yep. It's the end of this week, then, I think. To note the remaining items of the information request to the Department, and to note the routine paper circulated on Friday, the 27th of November, 2020. Content? Great. Board work programme, the clerk's brief and common framework is at page 332. Do we have any comments? I ask the Department to provide the information requested in the clerk's brief in relation to the two frameworks that fall within the remit of the committee. Are we agreed? Okay. Schedule written evidence from the Department of the Forward Work Programme once the summary frameworks are available. Agreed. Uh, the outline framework agreement for public procurement arrived in the committee office this morning and will be included for the papers for next for next week's meeting. I think that's useful. Uh, an update of the draft forward work programme. on the procurement. Sorry, the outline framework agreement for public procurement. Remember the. Um, Minister said he was going to. Yeah, it's um, the the two frameworks for the Department of Finance are in public procurement and statistics. Yeah. The outline framework arrived in the committee office this afternoon, just yeah. before the meeting, so it'll be included in Next papers in the arising from the minister's statement yesterday. No, sorry. There are issues. No, there are. Those are those are those are those are different issues, and we okay. need to take that on as a significant body of work. Um, update a draft forward work programme for September December is page three three four. Uh, just to remind members that the business director leader of UK Fire and Glasgow office leader Arup was not available to give expert evidence today due to other commitments, but has agreed to provide oral evidence to the committee on the amendment of the building regulations on the thirteenth of January twenty twenty one. Uh, are we agreed to receive that oral evidence, and if we can also receive that? Sorry, oh, no, sorry, carry on, just, uh, but I just have a point on there. Forward Works Program. Okay, right. Um, yeah. Under U for UCAS, and also try and include that evidence as we mentioned earlier on. Yes, chair. Okay, no problem. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Chair, and I'm not sure whether it's the proper place or not for it. But do we have a role when it comes to um, um, scrutinising the Royal Mail? 
Royal Mail. Royal Mail and them fulfilling their obligations. In what, in banking or in? In the delivery of post. It's not a devolved matter, I don't I think. think. it's reserved. I think it's a reserved matter. I know, uh, see, they're actually privatised yeah. to a great extent. They have a royal charter for the delivery of mail, I think, and I think it is a reserved, I think it is a reserved matter. Is it? So, can we do some research on it? I don't want to give a, yes, I don't, I don't want to get, because of the right. Let, let's do some uh, analysis of it and we'll get back to you on that I one. Just, okay, I'll do fine. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, more than happy to do some further research on that. Uh, where are we? Um, sort of inform the committee's request for all departmental bids for capital and resource funding during the pandemic has been received from all departments. If they're content to forward the responses to raise to conduct analysis before bringing the responses to the committee, are we content? And from the members, the minister's statement on the establishment of a new procurement board was tabled at page five. Uh, before I ask for any comments, uh, there is, I think there's quite a few areas that we need to look closely at this procurement board. Um, what the terms of reference of the procurement board is, how it's going to interact with the other departments, how it's going to have, what's accountability and responsibilities likely to be, is it policy directed, how is its relationship with the, the executive, and how that executive departments feed into it and the, the way the, the board has worked. I think uh, I would like to, I think we do have to take um, some, uh, we do have to look at this quite closely and scrutinize the role of the procurement board. I think generally speaking, there is an indication from the Northern Ireland Audit Office as that we do need to do something about sorting out our government procurement systems. This could well indeed be a helpful sort of tool to do that, but we need to have a greater understanding of how it's going to work so that we're able to give it the appropriate level of scrutiny. Sir Pat. Thanks very much, sir. Um, of the social value, uh, there was a, a part that was brought into that social value, and I suppose we need to define is it in policy, broadly based, or, or is it going to be assessed on like case by case? I mean, uh, uh, these aren't questions, we're not putting these out now, we're just going to look at that one. It comes collectively together. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, we'll look to do that. I think we should do. It. We'll, 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 we'll have to take. We'll have to take evidence on it, and we'll have to uh, formally analyse it. Paul. Yeah, I would welcome the the private sector development and 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 uh, input into it. Now, I think that's a massive thing. Um, but I, I also then worry about the lack of the accounting officers being present uh, within the the board. And then also, I think it was only I counted four departments that were mm -hmm. really directly connected to the procurement board now. And, and it struck me some of the questions that were asked on the floor were about education. I'm not sure that education was one of those departments that was directly involved now in the, the procurement mm -hmm. board. So where is the bridge between the procurement board and the accounting officers? And where is the bridge between the procurement board and the rest of the departments when we're talking about joined up government? When we're talking about the procurement needs in something like education that gets down right down into the very day-to-day -day workings of a school, mm -hmm. uh, I just would like to see all that joined up and, yeah. and how the how the minister foresees that happening. Yeah, and also I'd like to see it's proposed into relationship with the fiscal council because you know reforming government procurement around the sort of three billion a year budget that it's likely to be utilised. But unless that's done within a sort of a wider fiscal framework, I mean, in some respects, it's all well and good saying you're going to reform sort of the procurement process and you're going to use best green initiatives and you're going to use social enterprise and you're going to use these other things. But unless it's done within a sort of an appropriate fiscal framework, it, it's defeating the object of having the board in the first place. And just, just to come back in, why is, why is the procurement board so important, uh, not only to the government but to public life? is because as an electrician, I worked in 20 years, 10 years as a foreman, and the majority of my work as a commercial industrial electrician was on schools and hospitals. It is key to the economy, and that's why the procurement board is so important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, does it require in any regard fresh legislation? It wasn't entirely clear to me if it can all be done by a policy announcement. I think it's like some clarification. I certainly think we need to hear 
Yeah, we, we do need to, and that's one of the questions we will need to ask. Will it need sort of uh, sufficient legislation to give it the necessary clout and also to give it the necessary framework to be able to do what it has, to, you know, if, if it has to do? Because I would imagine, because within the Northern Ireland Act, of course, the unique situation where the ministries themselves have a complete responsibility for their budgets. <coughs> so, unlike other government or other governments on these islands, where it's directly responsible to the, the cabinet and through the Department of Finance, where the money comes from, because it's the desegregation of the budgets, and each minister has got control over that particular budget. You're quite right; it might need additional legislation to allow the procurement board to be able to do its coordinating function, what it's likely to do. Yep. But that's a, that's something for subsequent subsequent work. Okay, are we content for the draft forward framework for September December 2020? Great. Chair, before you move on, uh, just a little bit of real time. Uh, I've just been informed by Phil. He sent me Phil Pateman has sent me a, a document that outlines that uh, postal services is a reserved matter. All right. Okay. Thank you. Alice, well, are you happy with that? Yeah. Um, is there something specifically you wanted to get to? Yeah, um, I don't want to. Just, uh, if, if, I know it's well, a reserved matter, but it's something specific. Two artists like your letter to Santa. Delivery of your letter to Santa. That's where clearly they have uh, maybe uh, had um, objectives in terms of maximising profit to the expense of delivering the service to the general public. Okay. Do you want to work up a specific question? And bring it to the committee. If you work up a specific question to the committee, we'll sort of we will write on behalf of the committee to the Royal Mail on those specific issues. And I know it's a reserved issue, but if it's if I mean if it's something to do with services, banking, or something like that, I think we could at least write on behalf of the committee to do that. If you were content for that, well, I've actually written directly to the Royal Mail on that as well too, as an MLA. And effectively, you know, I've had it even from the workers on the ground that they're prioritising delivery of parcels mm -hmm. uh, over the delivery of post. And as a result of people not receiving post in certain areas and the likes of it, uh, they end up missing vital appoint appointments and that, in particular like health appointments and so on. You know, it's the type of thing that's been born continuously that you say to yourself, this is nearly um, sort of a direction of travel within the actual meal itself, and I don't think that it's um, sort of only in the likes of the Northwest that's happened. I suspect that's happened in a lot of all areas too. Okay. <clears throat> um, and any other business? I'd like to inform members of the report of the examiner of statutory rules to the Assembly and the appropriate committee's 31st report of session 2019-20, 25th of November 2020, is at page 338. I'd like to draw your attention to that to the examiner's statutory rules as reported on SR 2020-2009, Business Tenancies, Coronavirus, Restrictions on Forfeiture, Relevant Period, Northern Ireland No. 2, Regulations 2020, and referred to the breach of the 21-day rule, but was content that the Department has, on this occasion, provided a satisfactory reason for the breach. I also like to inform members of the report of the examiner's statutory rules to the Assembly and the appropriate committee's 32nd report of the session 2019-20. 27th of November 2020 is page 346. <coughs> the ESR has reported on Statute Rule 2020-280, Statute Rule 2020-221, Statute Rule 2020-230, Statute Rule 2020-262. I can read out the full titles if you would so no, wish me. Oh, you. We, we believe you. Inform <laughs> <laughs> the members that the Statute Rule is reported on Statute Rule 2020-221. 2020-230 and 2020-262 are in breach of the 21-day rule. I was content that the Department has, on this occasion, provided a satisfactory reason for the breach. If you have any other additional items of business, the Queen. Uh, thank you very much indeed. The date and time of the next meeting uh, in here uh, next Wednesday at 14. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. We'll be here. Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.